um, you know, it, it was the government was going to go ahead with it. Um, my congratulations, you've proved me wrong. I was, I'm very, very, very <laughs> to protect the interests of citizens. Right, my name is Ivan. I am a columnist. Uh, I write about a lot of things that seem obvious to me, like the virtues of minibus taxis, uh, the evils of charity, um, the health benefits of MSG, <laughs> and the costs of energy saving light bulbs. Uh, economics, politics, environmentalism, you name it, I've likely written an opinion about it, or I'm just about to. In the process, I've made myself fairly unpopular in certain quarters. For example, I've spent a lot of time weighing all the evidence for and against shale gas drilling and concluded that I'm not opposed to fracking in the Karoo. This doesn't go down well in towns like Prince Albert, where I was two weeks ago. Over there, they think I could pay by shell. All evidence to the contrary, notwithstanding. <laughs> Long story short, one day I got a call from uh, Marlene Fry at Zebra Press asking me if I'd write a book. And I said, um, no, I don't want to write a book. I have enough trouble with my life. I said, but we're in a mouse. I said, I know who you are. I said, well, we'll pay you. I said, oh, you won't pay me enough. <laughs> So I well, write about how environmentalists exaggerate and how bad that is for developing countries. So they're all right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how my first book came about. Uh, I never wanted to write a book. Um, it happened. I completely missed the deadline. But that was also okay because so does the government. Uh, as a rule. And they kindly decided to postpone the lifting of the fracking moratorium to the very week that my book went on sale. The book's subtitle is How Environmental Exaggeration Harms Emerging Economies. Now, that's because it has a lot of ease in it and I'm a sucker for alliteration. <laughs> this is shorter. Maybe I should make it that. Or this. Or even that. <laughs> <laughs> Be skeptical of everyone. Green rhetoric may be very well intended, but it is truly surprising how often when you start looking at their claims, they turn out to be exaggerated or even outright false. Environmental exaggeration not only happens, uh, but it is routine. They always tell us that we're facing some disaster or another. The prophets of doom have always told us that the end of the world is now. And usually, it turns out that they're wrong. Every time something bad happens, they say it's our fault. <laughs> Sometimes they're right, but far too often they just cry and walk. So I went looking for examples, right, and I avoided the easy cases that would obviously suit my narrative. Um, I chose some very hard cases where you really couldn't say much good about the environmental situation to see if even those would support my thesis that environmentalist routine, etc. And let me show you a few of those. This is, or I was, Deepwater Horizon, one of the largest oil rigs in the world. It's now a home for fish. <laughs> it was also one of the safest oil rigs in the world, and it had just won a major industry award for years of instant free operation, which the big rigs at BP and Transocean were duly celebrating on board. Just hours after they left by helicopter, the rig exploded. <clears throat> the operators got cocky, in equal measure because of ordinary human hubris, irresponsible cost cutting and, let's not forget, a perverse incentive in that the legal liabilities of oil companies were capped under US law. They got cares. Well, the managers got away safe, but 11 oil rig workers died. Now, if you forgot about that detail, it's because human deaths so often get buried at the end of environmental catastrophe stories. Anyway, the rig sank, and for the next few months, millions of barrels of oil spewed into the Gulf of Mexico. This was not a joke. This was a disaster and a massive cleanup operation began. The 11 dead workers were soon old news, but over the next six months they counted thousands of dead seabirds. They said the oil would head up the east coast of America, killing everything along the way, up to and including the Arctic. And when that wasn't scary enough, they showed you the great ocean conveyor to convince you that nowhere was safe. They said the entire Gulf of Mexico would be dead for years. They said fishermen in the area would never fish again. The problem is they were wrong. They took a bad situation and made it look much worse. 
Yes, 8,000 birds died, but out of how many in the Gulf? Nobody ever bothered to put that number in perspective. All the washing up in the Arctic? Never happened. East Coast of America? That's just fine. But you know, while environmentalists and journalists were milking the story for all it was worth, there were people living along those coasts. Many of them were fishermen. Some of the fishermen believed the newspaper stories about never being able to fish again. A few of them committed suicide. The fear mongering hit the locals really hard, doubly hard, on top of the world sport. So eventually, a scientist spoke up and said, listen people, understanding the impact of oil spills on the ocean is important. Avoiding oil, oil spills is a good idea. Cleanup techniques can be improved. But we can't go around scaring people so much that they, that they commit suicide. Right? And I think he's right. Today, the surviving fishermen are back in their boats. It's not all hunky glory. Uh, profits were lost, damage was done. And people are right to be upset about all of that. But the story that they never fish again was nonsense. Unlike the Deepwater Horizon 11 and the fishermen who committed suicide, the Gulf of Mexico is very much still alive. Now, when you see oil spills like that, right, how much do you think it adds to the total oil pollution in the ocean? Deepwater Horizon falls under spills from production activities, which accounts for 2% of all the oil in the ocean. If you look very carefully, it's that thin blue slice at the top. Unlike tanker or oil rig spills, operational spillage from ships cleaning out the bilges or runoff from land which is the yellow slice, right? doesn't produce photogenic or sick birds for the newspapers, so nobody ever reports on it. And the biggest source of oil in the ocean? Natural oil sinks. Under the harsh conditions of sea and sun, chemical processes of bacterial action break down oil. No reason, you know, the sea recycles it. The sea knows how to deal with oil. Even our very biggest spills don't turn out to be quite as catastrophic as they seem at first. Now, look, that's not to say we shouldn't care about pollution. Right. But sensationalism and fear-mongering is neither a rational nor a useful response. Let's talk about another green bug here. I'd ask you if you know where this is, but um, there's a bit of an obvious clue in the <laughs> photograph. This is Kuberg Nuclear Power Station. Many environmentalists don't like nuclear power either. Why? Well, there's an old political reason, of course. Back in the Cold War days, nuclear weapons were much feared. And although the link to nuclear power is very tenuous, Nobody's ever accused the hippie counterculture of philosophical sophistication and consistency. <laughs> but there is more rational reason why environmentalists don't like nuclear power. This is why. This is Chernobyl in Russia. In 1986, it blew up and a lot of people died. It caused cancer in a lot of survivors and was generally a rather messy affair. This is Three Mile Island, which scared the whole of America in 1979 and was the inspiration for the scary thriller, The China Syndrome. And this is Fukushima Daiichi, just last year. When a massive earthquake and tsunami hit Japan, one of the largest and oldest nuclear power stations in that country was destroyed and went into meltdown. So, question, how many people died at Fukushima? No. No. Exactly, let's list these three. The three worst nuclear power station accidents in living memory. Nobody died at Fukushima. 20,000 people did die from the earthquake and tsunami that caused the nuclear accident. No. But in most news stories, again, Human death and misery was relegated to the very last paragraph, where journalists put superfluous stuff that the editor could cut if his limited space. Now, again, you know, we shouldn't take nuclear safety, safety lightly, but let's compare energy sources in terms of safety. Here are all the major sources of electricity ranked by how many people died per unit of power produced. Nuclear is safer even than wind and solar power. <laughs> <laughs> Don't joke, do you know how many people fall off roofs installing those bloody services? So, <laughs> now, ironically, Fukushima proves the safety of nuclear power well after it should have been decommissioned. It was operated by a reckless monopoly that cut corners. It was designed to withstand much less than what nature eventually threw at it. What happened? Besides, where do you think most radiation comes from? As it turns out, nuclear power, like those production oil spills, by far the smallest source of radiation exposure. A little light blue slice at the top. Medical treatments, natural background radiation, including in the buildings around us, exposes to vastly more radiation than the nuclear industry does. Did you know that in normal operation, a coal fired power station emits 100 times more radioactive waste into the environment in the form of fly ash than a nuclear power plant? But notice the purple slice over there, right? That, that represents radiation in our food. 
Take the humble banana. The very symbol of healthy food, right? They're not scary, are they? <laughs> well, are they? And truth be told, this guy is selling you something that you would struggle to get past an airport radiation detector. Bananas, like many fruits and legumes, absorb radioactive potassium from the soil. About eight tons of them are equivalent to a kilo of low-level radioactive waste. And guess what happens to all the bananas and nuts we eat? Our bodies absorb the radioactive potassium isotopes and deposit it out of the way in our bones. We're all radioactive. <laughs> bananas people are terrified. Now see what I just did there. Why is this relevant? Because when they give you scary numbers, like 10 times higher than normal, you know, or a thousand times background levels, they compare it to extremely low normal levels. Regulatory risk aversion is very, very high. So when an accident happens, safe limits are very easily exceeded. Here's another number strip they use. Um, do go to that website. Um, there's um, great information on that chart. Another number strip to use. Use big, scary, context-free numbers. Fracking a gas well takes 20 million liters of water. Right, well, how much is 20 million liters of water exactly? Well, the average golf course, for example, like this one in the Karoo Heartland town of Crawford or this one in Grahamstown, both of which I've been to in the last two weeks, actually, uses 20 million liters of water in 10 days. That's how little 20 million liters really is. Now, in South Africa, there are 430 courses from Aberdeen to Swartkops. In a year, they use enough water to drill 15,000 shale gas wells. If you were to draw that water from the Gharib Dam, once off, you'd need 3% of that dam's capacity. Now, when environmentalists exaggerate, they not only cause governments to enact prohibitions and impose regulations that not even rich economies can afford. That undermine their own cause because of the prime war phenomenon. So I thought, you know, why would they do this? Why do people use these scare tactics? And I went and I explored a few of the possibilities. And it isn't just that a louder, exaggerated message is, is necessary or more likely to be noticed. Um, there are deeper reasons. The most banal of them is simply that research funding is hard to get, unless you connect your subject to something scary. But the late science novelist Michael Crichton views environmentalism as a new religion for the urban elite. And indeed, the parallels he draws are pretty startling. Modern science, technology, and commerce, eating from the tree of knowledge, have led humanity from a state of innocent purity to one of moral degeneration. If there once wasn't Eden, an unspoiled nature, it is now corrupted by our sins and excesses. As a consequence of the sin, we will be judged in an inevitable apocalypse of global warming or even human extinction. There is a hell, and we're in the handbasket that's headed there. However, we can assuage our guilt by seeking salvation in sustainability, by practicing good deeds and recycling and partaking of the sacrament of organic food. <laughs> we have a priestly case like Al Gore and dead saints like Rachel Carson. But yeah, my favorite theory is put forward by a trio of skeptics. Uh, Nigel Lawson, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer under Margaret Thatcher. Nigel Calder, who was the former editor of The New Scientist. And Patrick Moore, who was a one-time founder of Greenpeace. He left the organization back in the 80s when he got um, very annoyed with how they were treating their environmental causes. These guys reckon that Thatcher needed to crush the unions, right? And she didn't trust OPEC. So she went to the Royal Society with a bag of shiny sovereigns <coughs> And said, go away and make a case against fossil fuels. And they obliged, and they came back to tell her that we're all going to die. Now, not only did Maggie like what they said, but so did the Back to Nature movement, which abhorred industrialization and everything that goes with modern life. And then the Berlin Wall fell. Right? And suddenly you got a whole lot of fellow traveler activists, millions of them, who were left to the loose end. And they found in environmentalism a cause that allowed them to continue their anti capitalist crusade under a greed rather than a red banner. I just love this theory. I mean, the notion that modern organized environmentalism is all a plot by Maggie Thatcher to break the unions. I mean, is there a better story than that? 
You know, what I prefer to advocate is a notion that is largely rejected as heresy by the Greek priesthood. It's the one of being students of the environment. We live in the environment. We grow our food in the environment. We need a healthy, productive environment. You know, and that can't mean we should never take any risks. We can't just ban anything that, ev that affects the environment at all. It just means we should be stupid about it. You know, we shouldn't do harm that we can avoid. We should be sensible with how we manage the natural world around us and hold those who exploit natural resources accountable for their actions. If we always go around scaring people and shouting exaggerated demands of politicians, nobody's going to get any return or live any longer. We should, just, we should distrust environmentalists as much as we distrust corporate spin. That, apparently, is a terribly evil thing to say. But luckily, not everyone agrees. And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.